Thank you very much for that introduction, Gordy. And I have to say, it's, it's a, an honor for me to be standing here today to be giving the Tao Yu Wu lecture, and uh, a real privilege and a pleasure for me. And I, I thought that I would step back a bit and talk more generally about the universe and the continuing surprises that the universe is continuing to reveal to us. Three discoveries that, I, that I'd like to concentrate on today, uh, discoveries that were made in the 20th century, and uh, the first is that the universe is expanding. That was something discovered by Edwin Hubble in the year 1929. Uh, the universe no longer we think of as static and unchanging. It's evolving and expanding. And we've only learned in the last few decades that the universe is filled with dark matter. This is matter unlike the matter, the ordinary matter that we're made out of, that the Earth is made out of, that the sun is made out of. And it turns out to be the dominant uh, component of matter in the universe. And not only that, but uh, 15 years ago, it was discovered that the universe is accelerating and it's filled with a, what astronomers have called dark energy. And it's, it is the dominant component in the universe, causing the universe to be stretched apart and not just expanding, but speeding up in its expansion. So let me begin with the expansion of the universe. That was a discovery made by the astronomer Edwin Hubble, after whom the Hubble Space Telescope is named. And he made this discovery in 1929, and he was using telescopes that were built in Mount Wilson, California. And th these were telescopes, this is the 100-inch telescope shown on the, on the left here. And he made two rather astounding discoveries. The first is that there are other galaxies in addition to our own Milky Way galaxy. And that wasn't known at the time of these observations. And in fact, there was a, a debate, a major debate, about the nature of the universe and objects that were referred to at the time as nebulae. Nebula is a, a Latin word, it means fuzzy. And these were objects that were seen on photographic plates. These were the detectors at the time, large glass photographic plates. And the question was, were the nebulae, these objects, many of them having spiral shapes, were they regions perhaps in the Milky Way where gas was collecting under gravity to form new stars? Or were they, in, in their own right, galaxies like the Milky Way, but at greater distances? And what Hubble was able to show was, by measuring the distances, that these were objects outside of the Milky Way. And in fact, there are about 100 billion such objects in our observable universe. And that would have been an astounding discovery in its own right. But he went on to discover that these galaxies were taking part in an overall expansion of the universe, and that our universe is, has been expanding over time. It is a dynamic and evolving universe. So how did he do that? Uh, the story starts back with uh, two individuals, Andrew Carnegie and George Ellery Hale. And Andrew Carnegie started uh, what we now know as the Carnegie Institution for Science. And George Ellery Hale was a, a solar astronomer who had built a telescope at Yerkes uh, in Wisconsin and, and was convinced that the way to make progress in astronomy was to build larger telescopes with reflecting mirrors. And, and together, these two individuals uh, set about building new telescopes, first at Mount Wilson and then at Palomar in California. And here's George Ellery Hale standing up here at the left. And he was quoted often quoting the uh, uh, architect, American architect, Daniel Burnham, who was apparently fond of the saying, make no little plans. And the rest of the quote goes on to say something for, uh, to the effect that, for they have no power to stir men's blood. And, um, and, and George Ellery Hale really lived that. He built what were the successively largest telescopes in, in the world at the time, each in uh, starting with the Yerkes 40-inch refracting telescope, then at Mount Wilson he built solar telescopes, then the 60-inch telescope shown here, the 100-inch telescope, and what is amazing to me is somebody who's been leading this project to build this giant Magellan telescope, which is a 25-meter telescope. He began the 100-inch even before the 60-inch had been completed, which is sort of staggering to imagine taking that on. But, um, and then he was the driving force between the, behind the 200-inch or the 5-meter telescope at Palomar. And uh, the 100-inch telescope is what astronomer Edwin Hubble used. He's shown here examining a photographic plate. And Hubble arrived at Mount Wilson interested in this question of what was the nature of these nebulae, these fuzzy objects that were seen on the photographic plates. 
And what he found, this is the Andromeda Nebula, this is a nearby galaxy, uh, and of course this is all relative, what we mean in astronomy by nearby, this object is about two million light years from us. That's a distance where light traveling at 186,000 miles per second takes two million years to reach us. And Hubble began a program where he would go up to the telescope, turn a photographic plate to the sky, and, and he took a successive series over a period of months and years. And what he's marked here in this red rectangle, you can see the VAR exclamation mark, and he's noted that there's a star on this plate that is variable, changing in its brightness, and he puts an exclamation mark there. He was quite excited about that. And what Hubble discovered, this is 6 of October 1923, was that the variation of this star was such that the, the star would rise to brightness fairly quickly, and then it would fade more slowly, then it would increase its brightness again, fade more slowly, and it did this in a very regular pattern. And this kind of star, known as a Cepheid variable, had been identified in the 1700s for stars within our own Milky Way galaxy. And they are the best means that astronomers have for measuring the distances to objects. And Hubble was able to show that this Andromeda galaxy was not an object within the Milky Way, but in fact uh, uh, a couple million light years away. He, he didn't quite have the distance right, he was off by uh, a factor of eight or so, but, um, but he was able to show that it was a very great distance indeed. And this is the plot that he published. This is in the uh, National Academy of Sciences journal in 1929. And what's shown is the um, velocity increasing upward, the distance increasing to the right. And you can see, although there's scatter in this plot, there is a correlation between the velocity that a galaxy is moving at or receding from us at and the distance to a galaxy. So the farther away that a galaxy is, the faster that it's moving. And in 1915 to 1917, Albert Einstein had developed a theory of gravity and uh, the general theory of, of, of relativity. And, and Einstein had, in fact, known that the universe could not be static and that the universe, because of either gravity pulling things together or perhaps some other force, would be um, in motion. It would either have to be expanding or contracting. And so what Einstein did to, because when he talked to astronomers of the day, there was no evidence that the universe was in motion. So he added a term into general relativity to force the universe to be static. It was later recognized that, that in fact, that universe wouldn't be stable. And literally, if somebody coughed or sneezed, you would, you know, the universe um, would have expanded. But um, he, he introduced a constant called the cosmological constant to force the universe to be static. And then when, when Hubble came along and discovered the expansion, uh, Einstein was reputed later to have said this was his biggest blunder because he could have predicted the expansion. He knew that the universe would not be static. We'll come back to that because it turns that out that Einstein may have been correct after all, and um, introducing this cosmological constant is a term that may explain the dark energy component in the universe. So here's Einstein. He came out to uh, Pasadena in uh, 1931, and I think to check on Hubble and make sure that he was looking through the telescope correctly. <laughs> And of course, he, he didn't realize he had to turn the lights off in the dome if you were going to observe. But um, in, in any case, together, it was Hubble's observations and, and Einstein's theory that led to a picture of an expanding universe. So if you have a universe that's uh, expanding now, then there would have been a time in the past when matter would have been closer and closer and closer together. And there would have been an epoch very early in the universe with a very high density, very high temperature. And this gave rise to what we now call the Big Bang Theory, so consistent with general relativity. And, and our current picture is that the universe started off with this Big Bang phase. There was a, an early phase, what uh, physicists refer to as an inflationary epoch, where there was a very rapid expansion of the universe, happened in the, in the first fraction of a second after the Big Bang. And uh, what we can see first is the, the temperature of the background radiation as the universe has been cooling over almost 14 billion years, we look in the sky, you should see the remnants of the background radiation from this Big Bang explosion. And of course, that was discovered in the mid-1960s. And, and what is being seen is the, uh, are the first photons, the first light to escape 
that wasn't interacting and being scattered off electrons in the early universe. So the universe cools enough, you form the first hydrogen, electrons and protons combine, and then the photons that come to us from the Big Bang can freely stream to us, and we observe them now uh, in the cosmic microwave background about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Then now, 13.7 or 13.8 billion years or so after the Big Bang, we see galaxies, we see galaxies nearby, we see them distant. We know that they form, we're living in a galaxy, but the period between when the, uh, the first indications of ripples, density fluctuations that gave rise to galaxies that we see in the remnant radiation from the Big Bang to when they actually formed galaxies, we know very little about, and it's what astronomers now refer to as the dark ages, and upcoming facilities, the James Webb Space Telescope and the Giant Magellan Telescope, we're building on telescopes here in the Andes Mountains, are going to address those questions in future. And here is uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, named, of course, after Edwin Hubble. It's orbiting uh, about 600 kilometers up, orbits the Earth every uh, 90 minutes or so. And this was the first telescope that allowed us to view at optical wavelengths above the Earth's atmosphere. So it gave astronomers for the first time the ability to not be affected by the turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere that smears out, blurs the images coming to us um, from the distant sky. And you know, these images I'm sure are familiar to uh, pretty much everybody here. And we've learned an enormous amount in very different areas of astronomy, but galaxies, this is a, a galaxy seen face-on, not unlike what we might see if we got outside of our Milky Way galaxy, some more face-on galaxies. We've learned about um, individual star clusters. These are groups of stars that are held together by their mutual gravity and uh, held together, formed all at once and regions in our own galaxy where stars are forming. These are the regions where gas is coming together under gravity to form new stars in the way that the nebulae early on uh, were speculated to be, um, uh, turned out to be other galaxies uh, that uh, Edwin Hubble discovered. And literally, I could spend the whole lecture talking about Hubble and what it's discovered, but that's not the purpose of, of today's lecture, so I will move on to tell you more about these Cepheid variables. So these are the objects that Edwin Hubble used to demonstrate that there were other galaxies, and they're the same objects that we used with the Hubble Key Project, the group that uh, I led in the 1990s, to make measurements of the expansion rate of, of the universe. And these are stars, they're individual stars, and uh, they're about one in a thousand stars that we observe in nearby galaxies turns out to be a Cepheid variable. They're relatively bright and they're pulsating. So, so most stars, if you look at them in a human lifetime, don't change. There's no variation in them. But the Cepheids uh, are, have a, a region in their atmosphere that is unstable and the stars are actually pulsating. They're moving in and out. And it turns out that there's a correlation between how fast they're pulsating, their period of variation, and their luminosities, their brightnesses. And there's a unique correspondence between the two such that you can use them to measure the relative distances to galaxies. That is, if you find a Cepheid variable, you see how fast it's pulsating, you compare its brightness with a nearby object, and then by the inverse square law of light, you can determine the, the distance to that galaxy. And if you can then measure objects to which you know the distance uniquely, and there are objects in the galaxy that are close enough, Cepheid variables, where we can use geometric techniques to establish their distances. So the idea is the Earth is going around the sun, you make a measurement of a Cepheid variable, say in January, then the Earth comes uh, around, you make a measurement uh, at the other side of the Earth's orbit, and then it's just a triangle. It's ordinary Euclid geometry that allows you to measure the distance to that object. And of course, there, were, there are technical difficulties. This is why Hubble was off by a factor of seven or so. Turns out that these stars are formed in regions where there's gas and dust uh, in the Milky Way and in other galaxies. And that dust turns out to have uh, a size that's roughly comparable to the wavelength of optical light. So a photon comes to us from a Cepheid variable, it hits a dust grain, it gets scattered, it also gets reddened, it preferentially scat scatters the, the blue light. 
And so you think that the object is farther away than it actually is because it looks fainter. And it wasn't until uh, silicon detectors were developed, uh, um, solid state detectors in the 1980s that were able to make measurements at multiple frequencies to correct for these effects. And that's what we did with telescopes on the ground and with the Hubble Space Telescope. And ultimately, we're able to make measurements um, to allow us to move out, this is essentially the cosmic distance scale ladder, and uh, measure distances to nearby galaxies out into the distant Hubble flow um, and determine uh, if we can measure how far away galaxies are and how fast they're expanding, we can extrapolate backwards using the general the relativity, theory of relativity and determine the age and also the size of the universe. So I always like this Time Magazine cover. It really is all about time. Um, and this really, uh, this Time Magazine article came out when we had our first Hubble observations. And at the time, there was actually a conflict because the age of the universe that we were determining turned out to be younger than the ages of the oldest stars in our Milky Way galaxy, which of course is a contradiction because you can't have children that are older than their parents. Uh, doesn't work that way. And, and the resolution of this problem turned out to be, in fact, the, the, the acceleration of the universe. And the universe actually has sped up in its expansion. And if we didn't take that into account, we determined an age that was too young. But that wasn't known in 1995. The acceleration was discovered in 1988 and 1999 by, by two groups. Uh, and, and these are the measurements that we made. This is uh, on the right here, again, a, a plot of um, the upper right velocity compared with the distance to an object. And if you look at the first tick mark that's indicated in blue, that's where Hubble was able to make his measurements um, uh, out to that distance. So we can measure considerably farther now, and we have many more techniques to measure distances and to cross-check the methods and, and analysis. And, uh, and so we ended up with a, a value of this expansion rate, something called the Hubble constant, that was in between the values that had been determined by uh, earlier groups, and an age of the universe just short of 14 billion years. So for some of the experts in the audience, and I, I recognize there's a very general audience, and I love the fact that there are really young people here too, and, and people with a background in science and not, but uh, I'll just mention briefly that there have been some new measurements of the uh, fluctuations in the temperature of the microwave background that I mentioned a moment ago. And with a model, it's possible to infer this Hubble constant or the expansion rate. And there's a new discrepancy that's arisen. And uh, whereas before we were arguing about a factor of two difference, we're now arguing about actually a very small difference. But that could hold some very interesting results and uh, maybe signaling new physics, it may be signaling uh, difficulties in the measurements to date, but in any case, uh, that's something yet to be resolved, and, um, and, and it's something that our group is, is working on with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and its sister satellite, the Spitzer Space Telescope. And we found another way of measuring distances to galaxies, it's been around for a long time, but not used in a modern context in the near infrared, which will allow us to resolve this new discrepancy. Uh, these are star stars called Aurelires, and uh, we've just been awarded a lot of time on the Hubble Space Telescope to do that project. Data are rolling in, they're, they're actually, they're beautiful, and I think we'll be able to resolve this question reasonably soon. So the, the second discovery that I wanted to tell you about is uh, dark matter. And what I'm showing here is an image of uh, the astronomer Vera Rubin, who uh, in the 1970s with her collaborator Kent Ford was making measurements of what astronomers refer to as rotation curves of galaxies. And that's shown on the upper right. And so if you make a measurement of how fast stars are moving, uh, as a function of how far away they are from the center of the galaxy in which they reside, the expectation was that as you go farther and farther out in the disk of a galaxy, the velocity would fall off in the same way as we observe in our own solar system. This happens with the planets in the solar system. But instead, the, the velocities you can see in yellow, the yellow points, were increasing. They were either flat or rising with distance. And, and what that was uh, suggesting was that there was matter in the outer parts of galaxies that we weren't seeing in stars or gas, the luminous regions of galaxies, but something unseen 
that was causing uh, the velocities to remain bound to the galaxy, uh, whereas they would have flown off if they were moving at such high velocities based on the matter that we could see. And this was actually something that had been seen by an astronomer at Caltech um, in the 1930s, an astronomer by the name of Switz Wiki, Fritz Wicki was observing clusters of galaxies in, in this case, and he noticed that the velocities of the galaxies were much higher than they would have been uh, if there wasn't more matter there to hold them bound to the cluster. But nobody understood the reason for this, and, and essentially for decades it was largely ignored. Everybody understood the problem, but didn't have an explanation for it, and so until the measurements of these spiral galaxies came along in the 1970s, and then the uh, 1980s it became possible to measure gas in clusters of galaxies that was heated to X-ray temperatures, maybe 100 million degrees or so, and, and there was the same issue. This gas would have evaporated a long time ago unless something else, more matter, was binding it to the cluster. Uh, similarly, Einstein's uh, general theory of relativity predicted that light coming from the distant universe as it passed through a massive cluster of galaxies would be bent. You would actually have lensing of the light uh, and you can see the arcs. I'm trying to figure out if I actually have a laser pointer here and there doesn't seem to be a laser pointer. But I hope you can see these luminous arcs here that are predicted and, and eventually were observed in the late 1970s. Again, in, uh, astronomers infer from this that there is matter that we can't see. And so only about 4% of the overall mass in the universe uh, is, is luminous matter, matter uh, composed of ordinary, what we refer to as baryons. And the rest of it is dark, about six times more dark matter in the universe than luminous matter. And here are just some more uh, beautiful examples of some of these gravitational lenses. And in the 1980s or uh, 1990s, astronomers spent a lot of effort trying to ascertain whether the dark matter could be something that we were familiar with. Uh, rocks or planets, uh, maybe they were remnants of old stars that were just too faint to see, maybe it was cold gas, maybe it was hot gas, black holes, dust. Um, and they walked through the list and ruled out each of those uh, possibilities uh, uh, observationally. And uh, the remaining explanation is that it is a, an as yet undiscovered particle. And of course, Gordy Kane here has been working for a long time. Uh, one possible um, candidate for this dark matter is something called a uh, supersymmetric particle. And we're hoping that uh, that will be discovered in a year or so at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, this is what astronomers see when they look out at the universe. We see galaxies everywhere we look. The galaxies tend to cluster together. They're in large arcs and filaments. The universe is inhomogeneous. Um, this is what Gordy sees. This is an theorist view of the universe. That's the dark matter. It's an actual image. <laughs> And we hope ultimately we'll understand what that particle is. Uh, at the moment, we infer its existence because of the gravitational tug that we see on the luminous matter. And so the idea is that you start with this early epoch. There are quantum noise fluctuations in the early universe. Those are fluctuations in density that grow via gravity over time and give rise to the structure and clusters uh, that we see today. And uh, here's a simulation, oh, it works, good. Um, and it's now possible to simulate dark matter in uh, computer simulations that can uh, actually have billions of particles in them at this point. These are dark matter particles, and shown on the left are galaxies. So the luminous matter is, is a small component of the overall mass density of the universe. And it's by comparing observations of the large scale structure and these simulations that we're beginning to understand how structure formed in the universe and it requires the presence of dark matter. It doesn't form in the way that we see it unless uh, dark matter is included in the simulations. So we really do hope that the LHC is going to discover what uh, the dark matter is, and there are many experiments around the world uh, in underground laboratories looking in deep mines for what uh, could be a dark matter candidate, and I think it's, it really is going to be an exciting next decade uh, the theory suggests that we're very close to discovering dark matter. If we don't discover it in the next decade, I think that's going to be equally exciting, but maybe not in the same way, because we really do need to understand this problem. Uh, and so uh, we're hoping that will come from places like the Large Hadron Collider 
and uh, we'll have to uh, wait for those results. So let me turn now to the acceleration of the universe. Uh, as I mentioned, these uh, were two independent groups in, the, in 1998 and 99 made a discovery that the universe is expanding, they did, is accelerating. They did this by observing objects called supernovae. It's a special kind of supernova. It's believed to be in a binary system where a companion star is dumping matter onto an object called a white dwarf, a very dense object. Uh, and when the mass of that white dwarf exceeds a certain critical mass, uh, then the object explodes into uh, this type 1a supernova. It's very bright, and in fact, it could be as bright as an entire galaxy. So that lets us see it across uh, the visible universe. And uh, it's these observations that indicated that uh, as you look back, as, as techniques became, um, uh, the equipment and uh, sensitivity of detectors allowed you to measure, make these measurements at large distances, you could see that the objects were fainter than would be expected if the universe were not accelerating. Now you could ask, what if there was something intrinsically different about supernovae at earlier times in the universe. And a lot of us put a lot of effort into trying to ascertain whether that could be the case. Uh, but uh, in the end, uh, all of the results turned out to be consistent. And, um, and we do see evidence for this acceleration. And so that's indicating that the universe uh, is uh, the dominant component of the universe is in this dark energy form that we do not yet understand. We don't know the nature of the dark energy. We don't even have a good idea. At least with dark matter, we have very creative ideas and physically plausible ideas for what the dark matter could be. That's not the case yet for dark energy. And uh, it's why it takes so long to discover. It's uh, the density of the dark energy is very low. And just for comparison, it's uh, 10 to the minus 30 grams per cubic centimeter. So for reference, water is one gram per cubic centimeter. And for those of you in the audience who don't like metric, let me uh, convert that for you. That helps you if you don't like scientific notation. But the overall message is this is a very low density. And the only reason that we see it is because the volume of the universe is so large, we see its effects on astronomical scales. But it's very difficult at the current time. We can't detect the dark energy in a laboratory. Um, but essentially, this corresponds to an energy uh, of the vacuum of space. And um, uh, although, as I said, we do not understand the nature of it, it may be the cosmological constant, uh, the physical, uh, cosmological, physical explanation for the cosmological constant that Einstein originally added into his equation. And it's been called the biggest mystery of science and, uh, by some people. And so it really is for the young people in the audience uh, to solve, I think. So we're leaving some problems open for the next generation. And this is a major one. And I think in uh, previous decades, using the words uh, cosmology and accurate in the same sentence really was something you couldn't do. But the last few decades has uh, resulted in uh, astronomical discoveries that have really made fundamental contributions to, to physics. And uh, that's, a, that's a real change. So the universe is indeed stranger than we thought. Uh, about one-third of the universe is comprised of matter, about two-thirds in dark energy, but uh, we don't yet understand the nature of 95% of the universe. And so when you think of the complexity in the observed world we have, to imagine that there isn't complexity in this dark sector, I think uh, there are future surprises that uh, await us. So now I want to turn a little bit to what's on the horizon, and I did mention uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, this is a, a telescope that will be launched uh, by NASA in 2018, uh, collaboration between uh, Canada, Europe, and primarily the U.S. It's a six and a half meter telescope. It's the successor to Hubble. And um, unlike Hubble, which is in a, an Earth orbit, the, the James Webb is going to be located about a million miles away uh, in an orbit called L2. And uh, just for reference, the moon is about a quarter of a million miles away. So this is not going to be easily serv uh, serviced the way that the Hubble Space Telescope has been serviced. Um, and it's got to work the first time. Uh, there are these sunshades that have to unfurl. There are 18 segments to the mirror that have to unfold in space. So it's, it's really uh, quite a technologically challenging instrument uh, due to be launched in 2018. And, and it's going to be very important for uh, studying these dark ages that I mentioned, the, the earliest light in the universe. 
And then the next telescope I wanted to describe is uh, the Giant Magellan Telescope, and, and that's an effort that I have been leading uh, for the last 11 years. It's an unusual collaboration involving 10 institutions that are very different. There are state universities, there are private universities, there are countries, uh, there are institutions that are not universities at all, uh, the Smithsonian and the Carnegie Institution. Uh, it's a 25-meter telescope, uh, so that, if you imagine, it's, it's 80 feet in diameter. It's a giant telescope, uh, and it will have a resolution that is 10 times the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope, which is, that, that was a huge leap for us. Uh, this is yet another order of magnitude. So the, the site of the telescope is uh, Cerro Las Campanas in the Andes Mountains in Chile. It's a site that's owned by the Carnegie Institution, the 100 square miles that the Carnegie Institution owns. And it's the site of the Magellan, the current Magellan telescopes, of which Michigan is a partner. Michigan is a, University of Michigan is a 10% partner in the Magellan telescopes, uh, those two telescopes shown on the right. And we're hoping ultimately that the uh, University of Michigan will end up as a partner in the giant Magellan telescope, and we would, we would uh, really welcome such a collaboration. The interesting thing is that in the next uh, 50 years or so, maybe even the next century, the, the future of optical and radio astronomy is likely to be in the southern hemisphere. Uh, there's a lot of activity, current activity. Uh, the Europeans have built telescopes in the southern hemisphere, the Magellan telescopes, giant uh, Magellan telescope will be in the southern hemisphere. Um, there will also be a European large telescope, uh, the EELT, European Ex Extremely Large Telescope, ALMA, a radio submillimeter telescope, is in the southern hemisphere, and the uh, square kilometer array, which is yet to be built, um, a 21 centimeter hydrogen um, sensitive telescope uh, it, it due uh, to be completed in the next decade. And also this large synoptic survey telescope, the LSST, is in the southern hemisphere. So a big part of the focus of optical astronomy, radio astronomy, is going to be in the south. And I'm just showing uh, James Webb here because many of the observations are going to be very, very synergistic in the same way that Hubble works very well with Magellan and, and uh, other telescopes of the 6 to 10 meter class. So just for comparison, uh, the mount for the GMT stands about 43 meters high, so it's comparable to the Statue of Liberty, not including the base. Uh, there are the seven mirrors, uh, six in a circle, one in the center, and each one of those is 8.4 meters in diameter. And this is, uh, these are based on the actual design studies for the GMT, and you can see uh, the mirrors here, very lightweight structure. The top of the telescope, there are seven adaptive secondary mirrors. You know, you'll they'll come around, you'll be able to see those at some point. And each one of those mirrors, the secondary mirrors, will be uh, corrected on a time scale of about a millisecond, so thousands of a second time scale, uh, showing here the, the mirrors being placed into the telescope, although we promise to treat them more carefully than we're actually showing in the video. Um, and the plan is to get the first four mirrors into the telescope and the mount by 2021 and have two instruments on the telescope working at the time of, of what astronomers call first light. And at that time, it will be the largest telescope in, in existence. And so we are just putting the final phases of a legal agreement together to bring the partnership uh, to a point where we will launch construction uh, that we hope will be at the end of this calendar year. These are lasers being shown here. Uh, to, they will be shot up into the atmosphere and then reflected back down and allow us to make these corrections for turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. So we have uh, learned about this world of galaxies. This is something where GMT is going to uh, allow us to peer back into the early universe and have 10 times the resolution that we do with the Hubble Space Telescope to see the earliest light in the universe when galaxies and stars and black holes were first forming. Uh, and that's something that, again, uh, telescopes, as we increase the size, the telescope is going to have 25 meter uh, size compared to JWST, which is a six and a half meter telescope. So we'll be able to obtain spectroscopy, actually uh, disperse the light into a spectrum, measure spectral lines, allow us to determine redshifts or distances, the chemical composition of stars and galaxies that are forming, so that a lot of the astrophysics will come out of GMT. 
The other thing that's happened in the last couple of decades, uh, in, before 1995, we didn't know of the existence of other planets uh, outside of the, the, our own solar system. And that's changed dramatically. There are now almost 2,000 planets that have been discovered orbiting other stars. And there are about 4,000 candidates that are just awaiting confirmation, people having uh, the opportunity to measure orbits, velocities of, for these planets. And, and so the, the whole field has opened up. Uh, we've learned about different kinds of planets. There are hot giants, so-called hot Jupiters, that are massive like Jupiter. They're orbiting very close to their central stars, so they're hot. There are very icy worlds that have been discovered. There are water worlds. There are planets called super-Earths. And as the technology has improved, it's been possible to push down the limit. So we're getting closer and closer to being able to discover planets that have a massive Earth rocky planets like the Earth. And uh, the question is, could some of those planets uh, have life the way that our planet does? Uh, it's been speculated that there might even be diamond worlds, although I think uh, the early results may not have panned out for this uh, particular object. But the, the point is, we really don't know very much about uh, uh, other planets. We're only uh, beginning to understand that they're very different. Most of the other solar systems that have been detected, they don't look anything like our solar system. And so uh, the GMT and, and James Webb and other telescopes that are in the planning stages are, are going to allow us the opportunity to really learn about other worlds other than our own. So there are even planets that are orbiting two stars, and you know, what used to be science fiction <laughs> is no longer uh, just the province of science fiction. So the uh, GMT, when it's uh, built with the first four mirrors, will be the largest telescope in existence. It will be the first telescope capable of discovering planets like the Earth. And I think this is one of those discoveries that isn't going to just be of interest to scientists, but, but I think uh, humanity in general. So uh, it's an exciting um, uh, era that I think we will be opening up. So the partnership at the moment, there are 10 partners, uh, as I mentioned, uh, across the US, also Korea, Australia. Uh, Chile and Brazil and we are continuing to look for other partners and I'm serious when I say I really do hope that the University of Michigan will join this effort ultimately. The mirrors are very interesting. Uh, the way the mirrors and the telescope are built uh, at the University of Arizona involves a rotating oven which is underneath the football stadium at the University of Arizona. Um, I think it's a great use of space. <laughs> Most people don't know that it's happening underneath the football stadium. It wasn't what the football stadium was designed to do. <laughs> and, uh, but we've cast now the first uh, three mirrors. We're about to cast the fourth mirror for the telescope. And it uh, occurs in this rotating oven. And um, it's a whole long process. Actually, took, uh, it will take about four years for each of the mirrors. So this telescope will have 10 times the resolution of Hubble. And uh, just to give you some sense of what the capability in terms of resolution is, this is, if you look at, this is a cluster in a nearby galaxy. So look at the four bright blobs. And this is what you would see on Magellan, uh, on a night of good seeing, as astronomers refer to, when the atmosphere conditions are such that you have um, very precise images. Uh, this is what uh, you would see on the current camera uh, on Space Telescope, what we're using to, to study Cepheids and, and these RLIRI variables. So you can see the faint background that begins to resolve as you are looking at a, a 2.5 meter in space. Uh, this is a simulation of what the James Webb Space Telescope will see, and you can again see the improvement in resolution, and this is what GMT will see. So you can see the opportunity to uh, really look back, uh, you know, compare it again with what we see with the best conditions on Earth at present to what we will have with GMT. It's a spectacular jump. So uh, I think uh, we really are poised at this point to make a lot of discoveries in the next decade or two, uh, other planets uh, going around orbiting other stars, uh, planets that may be similar to the Earth, and also to learn something about this dark um, era of um, um, in, the, in, in the early universe when the first galaxies, the first black holes were forming, uh, these dark ages where we really know nothing uh, at this point. There's not any empirical data. Um, and so I think our, our universe really has turned out to be quite extraordinary. It's a, a universe full of continuing surprises. Uh, it's uh, vast, it's expanding, it's filled with these exotic objects. 
and uh, new kinds of matter and energy, which are the dominant components of the universe. And I think it's very unlikely to be through surprising us. So I'm going to stop there and say thank you very much. <laughs>